James. He is the Senior Manager of Governmental Affairs with Amtrak. He's going to give us a presentation on uh, his vision for Amtrak and what that would uh, you know, look like for our community. And uh, after that, uh, if, if any of the other elected officials uh, do are able to make it, we'll allow them to, we'll ask them to say a few words, but in the meantime, then we're going to have question and answers. So if you have any questions, please, you know, keep them in mind and hold them till after the presentation because you will be able to ask direct questions and we will answer them to the best of our ability. So thank you, Derek. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Thanks for the great turnout. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, we are so pleased that uh, you guys asked us to come out here. And we're pleased to be reading about the enthusiasm for a uh, uh, resumption of passenger rail service to Rockford. So it's definitely on Amtrak's radar as well, and we want to help the community do that. Uh, I'd like to first start off by uh, acknowledging and recognizing I actually brought a colleague of mine with me. Uh, Mr. Mark Maglieri is uh, our uh, Mark. Doing an interview. Oh, he's doing an interview. Well, uh, Mark, uh, he and I drove out here together. Uh, Mark handles our media relations uh, in the central part of the United States. If you've ever uh, seen him, on, you may recognize him on the news. He's actually a former Rock 40, and he managed the uh, news department for the public radio station here years ago. Uh, I also uh, came out with us is uh, Kendra Johnson. Uh, she's with the Midwest High Speed Rail Association. Uh, they are a key advocacy organization uh, here in the Midwest uh, in helping us carry the message to public officials on the important role that passenger rail can play in mobility uh, and economic development in our region. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started, and uh, we'll hold questions for afterwards. All right, so uh, many of you are, who are here may remember the days of the old Illinois Central uh, Black Hawk, and uh, some of you who are even younger might remember the Amtrak Black Hawk, excuse me, the Illinois Central Hawkeye, and the Amtrak Black Hawk, uh, which used to run between Chicago and Rockford uh, to Freeport, Galena, uh, and to Dubuque. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that train uh, was not uh, set up in a way to really meet the travel needs of the public at that time or today, uh, and we went through a sort of a budget uh, cutback in the state of Illinois, uh, and that train was operated under contract for the state of Illinois, like much of the Amtrak service is today, uh, and that train was withdrawn. Uh, and that was back in 1981, I think it was, uh, and so we are uh, looking to uh, return to Rockford, but return to Rockford in a way that is relevant for the way people travel today. Uh, so I'll talk to you a little bit about what Amtrak has been doing uh, in cooperation with states around the United States uh, to really see a renaissance in passenger rail uh, to meet the, need, the needs of the traveling public. So this is um, a map of the Amtrak system today. Uh, we uh, dispatch 305 trains a day over a 21,000 mile route network uh, connecting 500 cities uh, in 46 states and three Canadian provinces. Uh, for those of you who are not colorblind, you may notice the, the, the variance and gradation of the different routes that we serve. Uh, most people uh, who aren't familiar or regular Amtrak riders, when they think of Amtrak, they think of the long distance overnight trains with the sleeping cars and the dining cars. Uh, that is still a very important component of Amtrak, but that is not the majority of what Amtrak does. Those long distance overnight sleeping car trains, those are the light blue lines that you see traversing the country. Uh, the uh, a key component of Amtrak is also the red line in the, on the right side there. Uh, that represents the Northeast Corridor. Uh, that is the densest uh, populated part of the United States. Uh, Amtrak actually owns that stretch of railroad, so we're able to dispatch trains almost at will, as long as we can sort of weave them into all the commuter trains that are operating out of Washington and Philly and New York and Boston. Uh, about a third of our customers are on that route. Uh, and that route makes an operating profit for Amtrak. Uh, but what we're here today to more talk about are the sort of dark blue lines, like the ones radiating out of Chicago here or out of LA there. Those dark blue lines represent routes that Amtrak operates under contract for state governments, usually the State Department of Transportation. 
Uh, the reason that states do that is because they feel that the states that participate in that program, and there are 18 of them in the U.S., they do that because they feel that rail meets a critical transportation or economic development need for their communities. Uh, one of the 18 states, of course, is Illinois. Uh, California uh, is the largest state in terms of investing in passenger rail and contracting with us to run trains. An interesting tidbit, folks think of California, they think of the automobile and the freeway. Not as much the case anymore. California has really been investing a lot of dollars in expanding and growing their passenger rail network. Some of you may know that they are actually building America's first true high-speed network that will be totally great, separated with trains running more than 150 miles per hour. But today, and we expect them to continue to contract with Amtrak service, uh, on any day in the United States, one in five people on an Amtrak train is on an Amtrak train in the state of California. Uh, the corridor from San Francisco to Sacramento, we dispatch 36 trains back and forth every day. Uh, there's, there's trains almost hourly between those two cities. Between LA and San Diego, I think there's 11 or 12 trains each way a day, about 24 trains a day. Uh, so. Uh, passenger rail, the success of passenger rail is really driven by the frequency of the service connecting cities that are within two to three to four hundred miles apart. That's where the train can be really competitive and really provides value to the business community and to the travel consumer. Uh, here's a chart representing the growth in Amtrak ridership over time. Uh, Amtrak, a quasi-public corporation uh, founded or signed into law by President Nixon back in 1970, came into operation in 71. Our first full year of operation was 1972. We've gone from around 15 million customers to uh, almost 32 million customers over that time. Also, uh, rail ridership, uh, I like to remind my colleagues when we get depressed at some of the bureaucracy that anybody who works for anyone deals with. Uh, prior to Amtrak, that trend line was going down. The passenger train was dying. So Congress acting, to create Amtrak, an organization that was solely focused on reviving the passenger train, we in essence saved the passenger train. There's a lot more growth potential that's out there that we hope to tap into by expanding service to places like uh, Rockford uh, and the area uh, to keep that trend line going up. I talked about the states being the sort of the fastest growing part of Amtrak's business. The other piece that's important to note is, again, of all those Amtrak routes that you saw, the, the thick blue lines, the routes that we un operate under contract for states, half of Amtrak passengers are on routes that we are running for state governments. Uh, you can see there the 18 states that we have contracts with, Texas and the South, Texas and Virginia in the South, California and Oregon and Washington in the West, uh, to Massachusetts and New York in the East. Uh, we've got a very robust network in the Midwest. Uh, Michigan is a state partner of ours that's been investing in heavily in rail on several routes to Detroit and Grand Rapids. Um, uh, the state of Wisconsin uh, is a great partner of ours. Uh, we partner uh, with them to operate service from Chicago to Milwaukee. Uh, there are seven trains each way a day between those two cities. It's about 85 miles. They're about 85 miles apart. Does it sound like any two city pairs you might know? <laughs> How far is Rockford from Chicago? About 85 miles. Uh, and the state of Wisconsin, that, that service is so important to the business community in Wisconsin uh, that the previous administration, which could be perceived as anti-rail, was very much in support of the Hiawatha service. So much so that we've been working with the state of Wisconsin and the railroad that owns the track to invest in the track so that we can increase that to 10 trains each way a day between Chicago and Milwaukee. Uh, a lot of business travelers on those trains heading back and forth between those two important Midwestern cities. Now let's uh, zoom into Illinois. Uh, Illinois uh, always has been a transportation powerhouse. Uh, the economic uh, might that we have had is about is because of the transportation investments. It's because of the geography of where Illinois sits, and we've been very fortunate. Uh, the state has, uh, over time, invested a lot and worked with us in improving the passenger rail system. Uh, one sixth of all Amtrak passengers in the U.S. are on an Amtrak train in the state of Illinois. You can see there, there are four routes that we work with the state of Illinois to operate. Uh, the Chicago to Carbondale route, uh, running down the center part of the state, roughly paralleling I-57. Uh, you've got running at a diagonal, the Chicago to St. Louis route, uh, through Springfield and Bloomington Normal. Uh, and then there's a line heading over to Quincy, Illinois, 
Uh, Quincy, a population of 60,000 people, uh, has a couple of trains a day running back and forth every day, uh, runs through the city of Macomb, where Western Illinois University is. A re real solid support among the communities along all of these routes because they perceive that passenger rail really puts them on the map. It helps them in terms of retaining residents, retaining businesses. The colleges and universities are real important in our coalition of support in the state of Illinois because the towns that have Amtrak service are able to recruit and retain students uh, better than some communities that do not have that service. Uh, Chicago, uh, obviously the busiest uh, Amtrak station in the uh, state of Illinois. Uh, it's also the fourth busiest station in the United States. Um, Union Station, which is our hub, uh, if you add up Metro Rail passengers and Amtrak passengers, Union Station is actually busier than Midway Airport. Uh, so a real driver uh, of the economy in downtown Chicago. Uh, 56 trains per day uh, are dispatched out of the, uh, across Illinois uh, uh, by Amtrak. All right, I, I mentioned Illinois is second only to California in terms of the size of its Amtrak program. Uh, but the, and the, the real sort of flagship of the uh, Illinois Amtrak program is the Chicago to St. Louis corridor. We've got two major American cities about 280 miles apart, uh, and the state for a long time has wanted to invest and improve that service, uh, increase the speeds, increase the amount of frequencies. Uh, back about 10 years ago, there were only three trains each way a day. Uh, the state worked with us and with the railroads to increase that to five trains a day. We saw ridership really dramatically improve because, again, that frequency is really important. If folks can know that throughout the day there are going to be multiple trains they can take, they'll be more likely to use the train. Uh, business people, students love us because the trains all have Wi-Fi. So when they're, motor, when they're on the train, those are actually billable hours. Whereas if they're driving down the highway, that's wasted time for them. Uh, I got on the train this morning in Springfield uh, with quite a number of folks, and they were all working on their laptops. Uh, those of them who weren't noticing hangovers from the inauguration last night. <laughs> uh, the state of Illinois, uh, with federal grants, the federal government uh, is a real important funder for rail projects in states, provided the state of Illinois one and a half billion dollars over several grant cycles to upgrade the railroad line between Chicago and St. Louis. Uh, all new track, all new rail, new culverts, a new signal system was put in so that sometime later mid this year we'll be able to increase those speeds above the 79 mile per hour speed limit and take a stair step up to 90 with the eventual goal being up to 110 miles per hour uh, for that route. Uh, new locomotives have been placed in service and new, new coaches are being constructed right now uh, for services across the Midwest, not just the Chicago-St. Louis route, but the Carbondale route, the Quincy route, the routes to Milwaukee, to Detroit, Grand Rapids, and Lansing, Michigan. Uh, here's uh, again a blow up of just the uh, Chicago to St. Louis corridor uh, and the cities that it serves. A lot of new stations were constructed as well. Uh, I talked about some of the improvements, uh, the, uh, the new concrete ties, new rail upgrades to bridges, upgrades to crossing signals, uh, and there's an example of uh, one of the 33 locomotives that have been placed in service. Uh, built by a company called Siemens, which has a plant in Sacramento, uh, almost totally sourced with American parts. It's a German firm, but almost totally American built. Uh, there's a shell of a new passenger car that's under construction right now out in California, also by Siemens. Uh, these cars are already in service right now uh, by a private sector rail operator who runs trains uh, north of Miami down in Florida. Uh, the, the cars will be fully ADA accessible. Uh, there will be lifts uh, on the cars so that all of our customers can use them. They'll be Wi-Fi equipped. Uh, each car will accommodate up to four bicycles. Uh, so a four-car train will be able to carry 16 bicycles. Uh, Amtrak is, again, Amtrak is looking to the future in that we understand that regions around the country need to be connected. Uh, regions around many other regions are growing. Uh, we are part of the Great Lakes region here in Rockford, Chicago, uh, all around uh, over to Detroit and down to St. Louis. Uh, the Midwestern region and the states in the Midwest are part of a compact of states that have been working to develop a unified passenger rail network connecting all the major cities of the Midwest. Your Chicago's, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, Columbus, Detroit, the Twin Cities, because we feel by having an interconnected rail network, 
like they do on the East Coast, that positions the Midwest as an even higher quality place to set up businesses and to live if it's easy for you to connect with all the other places. Uh, it's more tra travel time by train is more productive, it's safer, and again, it's expanding the amount of travel options that people have. I talked about frequency driving success. Um, again, the more trains that you have, the more likely that you'll get business travelers, the more likely the train will uh, drive economic development in your community because a busy train station is almost like having a highway interchange right in your community. Uh, these are some folks, uh, again, I was in Springfield and I just happened to snap folks who were getting on the train this morning. Uh, that's the capital in the background and we had about uh, 60 people get on the train there this morning. Oh, and then no, again no, at normal. Sleeping. Oh, well, they're not sleeping yet because right. <laughs> they're just waiting to get on the train. On train. Yeah. The uh, bottom left photo is actually a picture at Kalamazoo, <coughs> Michigan. Uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan is on our Chicago to Detroit and our Chicago to Lansing and Flint routes, which we operate under contract for the state of Michigan. That is also a corridor that has received a lot of federal investment. And today, those people are getting on a train that is going to be going 110 miles per hour. Uh, Kalamazoo is one of our busiest stations in the state. I think it's the second busiest station in the state of Michigan. It's also the home of Western Michigan University. Uh, it's also, the train station is also the hub of their city's transit system. All of the transit buses pulse from there, and then Greyhound and Indian Trails over the road bus companies also stop there. So the Kalamazoo station is a real pulse point uh, for the downtown Kalamazoo economy. They've got new hotels going up downtown. There are new breweries there, so it's a real thriving, uh, real thriving place. Uh, the train station is bringing about 150,000 people a year, dumping them right into downtown Kalamazoo uh, every, uh, every year. Uh, here's an example, again, I talked about frequencies. Uh, this is a, a, a schedule of the Amtrak service between Chicago and Milwaukee. It's not important that you can actually read the times, but you can see all the columns. Uh, each one represents a train. So again, uh, business people in, the, in Milwaukee or in Chicago, when they need to go to either city, they know they could just go to the station, which is in downtown, the downtown of both city, get on the train, open up their Wi-Fi, there's no such thing as airplane mode on the train, and get work done as they speed past the traffic on Interstate 94. Uh, here's the uh, Chicago to St. Louis corridor and, and St. Louis to Kansas City. Uh, so again, frequency is what drives ridership. The state of Illinois' ultimate goal is to take this from five trains a day from Chicago to St. Louis up to eight trains a day. Again, a real game changer for the communities along the route. Uh, one, another thing that we've been doing in cooperation with communities is renovating and building new stations. Again, federal grant programs are out there now to help communities with building, uh, upgrading their existing stations and building new stations, and especially with an emphasis on turning them into intermodal centers, where the local transit agency is, where there are rental car services, where there is bike share. Uh, on the upper left, that is the Dearborn, Michigan train station. Uh, that is in a suburb of Detroit. Uh, that is one of the top three busiest train stations in the state of Michigan. Uh, again, all the transit services are there. Uh, upper right, uh, the little town of Dwight, Illinois, population about 5,000 people. They're on the Chicago-St. Louis route. They're very proud of their new train station that just opened a year and a half ago. Bottom left is Carlinville, Illinois, also a small community on the Chicago-St. Louis route. The mayor and the whole town turned out with music to actually celebrate the opening of their new station. And on the right is um, a through in Raleigh, North Carolina. North Carolina is actually very aggressive with growing their Amtrak program. It's a growing state. Charlotte and Raleigh are about 150 miles apart. Uh, they started out with one train a day between those cities, and now they're up to four, and they want to take it up to six. The existing train stations that they had were too small. So they're having to build brand new train stations to accommodate all the traffic. <coughs> uh, quality transportation drives investments. Uh, of note, uh, we've had several corporate headquarters relocations to the area right around Union Station in Chicago. Uh, again, having the presence there of high quality rail service, both Metro and Amtrak, uh, feeds into business decisions about where they're going to locate. We think about Amazon and they decided to, sh to move their business to places that had really high quality rail transportation. <clears throat> Normal Illinois is another city that's been capitalizing on their new train station. That's the celebration opening their train station on the left. 
Their train station is actually incorporated into their city hall. There's an iconic clock tower there. It's on their downtown, uptown circle, where they've seen lots of private sector investment in their downtown right by the train station, including a new Marriott and a Hyatt Hotel, uh, renovated movie theaters, parks, bicycle trails. The Children's Museum is there as well. So uh, elsewhere in Illinois, in addition to this route, uh, which we'd like to see come to fruition, uh, the Chicago to Quad Cities route does not yet exist, but it's moving forward. Uh, the state of Illinois did receive a federal grant from Uncle Sam in the, in the neighborhood of $177 million to actually restore service from Chicago to the Quad Cities of Moline, uh, Rock Island, Bettendorf, and Davenport, Iowa. Uh, you can see the building there. That's the, the track is there. Uh, what needs to just be constructed is a siding for the passenger station and a platform. Uh, the city of Moline worked with developers to take an abandoned old warehouse and convert it into a boutique hotel that includes the waiting room for the train station. So the city of Moline is ready. They're just waiting for the state of Illinois to finish negotiations with the freight railroad and to start building. Uh, upgrading the track, building the platforms, uh, and they're set to go. Uh, they see this as a linchpin of the economic development in their downtown. Uh, having the train station there, this will be the terminus of the route. Um, and they did something unique in the Quad Cities. Uh, unlike many places that have multiple cities in one region, uh, they compete with each other. But for this particular project, the four cities in two states decided that they would let the analysis show which place made the most sense to have the train station. And the analysis showed that Moline made the most sense and all the other communities supported it because they view themselves as one economic region. They're not going to let dotted lines on a map or a river divide their shared economic uh, need of having passenger rail service. Uh, so Quad Cities is ready to go. Uh, many times, and I'll focus, focus into a little bit of the financing, a lot of times we get barbs at, uh, thrown at us because we uh, supposedly are this big black subsidy hole. Uh, not so much the case anymore. This is a graph representing our operating subsidy from the federal government, how it has declined dramatically over time. Well, last year, the operating loss, we went from losing almost uh, more than $900 million in 2004 down to an operating loss of $168 million this year. We are on track to, in two to three years, take that operating loss down to zero. Uh, and a lot of that, uh, you know, Amtrak being qua a quasi-government organization, we do a lot to work with our congressmen up on Capitol Hill, uh, like your representatives, to help them understand that the investment in passenger rail is an investment in mobility and the investment in the economy of the United States. Um, so even though we won't be receiving an operating subsidy, like many forms of transit, we'll still need capital dollars to continue to invest in the system, buying new locomotives, buying new rolling stock, fixing up bridges and track. So my colleagues out in D.C., and they use me to an extent to work with congressmen who are out here to continue to make the case like I'm making to you guys today on why rail makes sense. These are some of the potential new services uh, that uh, we are actually working on to uh, get started up and running. I talked about uh, Chicago to the Quad City. Uh, I talked about uh, the new train, uh, several new trains to add to the seven between Chicago and Milwaukee, uh, the states of Wisconsin and Minnesota. Uh, more so Minnesota, but we expect now Wisconsin to step up to the plate to work with us on adding new trains from Chicago to the Twin Cities. Uh, the state of Minnesota, uh, is, has their, their plans are all done to set up a whole new corridor between the Twin Cities and Duluth, Minnesota, uh, with eight trains a day, four each way. Uh, we're looking at extensions down in Oklahoma, uh, in Colorado, uh, between Cheyenne, Denver, and Pueblo. Uh, the state of uh, Virginia, uh, has been really expanding. Uh, they've added service to Norfolk uh, and to Roanoke in the last couple of years, and now they want to start adding frequencies because uh, one train just isn't enough. It's more tra more, the more trains you have out there, the more folks are going to ride. Uh, and in this spring, we expect to be adding two more trains between Seattle and Portland. I think Seattle and Portland are about 200 miles apart. Uh, Amtrak is the number one carrier over all the airlines in that corridor. Right now, we're running four trains back and forth each way. We're going to take it up to six. Uh, when the signal system is upgraded. Uh, and then there's new service we're looking at between New Orleans and Florida. And of course, at the bottom, we want this one too, don't we? So, uh, all right. And yeah, we, uh, what you guys need to do, you need to let your public officials know how important this is to you. 
Again, the addition of services like this, is, it's critical that the state government be a partner in that. Uh, and so that's where you guys need to talk to your state legislators, to your local officials, so that they can talk to state legislators, let Governor Pritzker's office know. Uh, we have been, that we are willing to continue to expand our great relationship with the state of Illinois by adding this route to the Amtrak map in the state. Because that map was missing. It had a gap up in the upper corner of Illinois where there's no, where there's no Amtrak service. And we'd certainly like to be a part of that. And that is all I have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let, me, let me add, we want to be able to put these signs up outside of the community. That says Amtrak serve community. Communities that have Amtrak service proudly post that sign when you're coming into town. So we want one of those here as well. Thank you so much, Mr. James. Um, Just call me Derek. Derek. Mr. James is my dad. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, uh, Derek. So, um, one, like Derek said, uh, the key to moving this forward is we have to get our elected officials who are not on board yet, on board. Pun very much intended. So uh, we do have um, multiple uh, elected officials in the state legislature who are not um, really on board with this. And what we need to do as constituents is uh, we need to uh, communicate with them. We need to organize and we need to make it clear that this is what we want and we insist that they do this. Uh, if you have not signed up, uh, signed in yet, please sign in so that I can uh, keep in contact with you, uh, let you know what's going on, and also let me know your address and where you live and if you're willing to call your uh, your alderman or your township uh, person, your state rep, your state senator, whoever. Yesterday, I had the privilege of being at the inaugural ceremony, and I want to make clear, this is not a partisan thing. We have, this is cross-partisan, every single, whether you're Democrat, Republican, Independent, Libertarian, whatever, we have strong community support. This is not, we cannot let this turn into a partisan thing. This is a community thing. We are all members of this community. And we need to influence all of our elected officials. And yesterday at the inaugural ceremony, JB specifically mentioned that we have to improve and re revitalize the infrastructure, including rail service. He specifically mentioned rail service. I have spoken to him personally on multiple occasions. When I told him I was going to put this on the ballot, he was very excited. What he is waiting for is to see that the local elected officials are on board. Uh, as far as finances go, in 2015, uh, the, the funding for this was set aside. And I have spoken directly with State Treasurer Michael Frerichs, who has told me what it would take is the governor's signature. There is legislation that would, you know, get that funding in place right now. So we need to come together as a community and make it clear to our elected officials that this is something we insist on them doing. So at this point, um, I would also like to introduce a few of our uh, other uh, dis you know, honored guests. We have uh, Jerry Pedraza here, who is the president of the Bring Back the Black Hawk. Uh, he and I have been in con contact and uh, you know, conversations uh, throughout the entire process of me getting this onto the ballot. Are you, would you like to say a few words? Okay. First off, we have some two gentlemen from Stevenson County, from Lena, Illinois, who worked very, very uh, judiciously working on the, the bringing back the train the last time. And we have gentlemen from Dubuque, who I meet with every Wednesday. Anyhow, a brief, brief comments. We have the opportunity to put together a coalition between folks in Iowa, Northwest Illinois, 
and make this thing work and make it work dynamically. Dynamically. Um, we need to be looking at, following up with Angie's point, how do we convince politicians, people who represent us, that this thing is going to work the way we think it's going to work. Let me finish this one point. Western Illinois University, they have a business institute, and I've been in contact with them regularly. They know what the university brings into Macomb, Illinois, and Western Illinois every year for economic development, over $15 million in the Macomb. They don't know the actual number, the data, about what that train means to the community. They know that it means a lot, but they cannot, they cannot come up with the actual data. That's the same thing with Quincy, okay? I'm talking about the Illinois Zephyr now, right? We're putting